People hate to be sold, but they love to buy. We become what we think about. Think and grow rich. If you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. The world is replete with time-tested advice and motivational ideas for aspiring salespeople. Dale Carnegie, Napoleon Hill, Norman Vincent Peale, Earl Nightingale, and many others have all published classics with guidance that, when followed closely, almost always leads to success. More modern personalities have emerged in the internet era, like Tony Robbins and Gary Vaynerchuk and Angela Duckworth, but for the most part, they've continued to rely on book publishing, seminars, and high-value consulting to peddle their insights and inspire action. Welcome to this video exclusive on theCUBE. This is Dave Vellante, and I'm pleased to welcome back Professor Mark Roberge, who's one of the managing directors at Stage 2 Capital, and Paul Fifield, who's the CEO and co-founder of Sales Impact Academy. Gentlemen, welcome, great to see you. You too, Dave, hey. thanks. Hey, All right, let's, be let's get right into it, Paul. You guys are announcing today a $4 million uh, financing round. It comprises $3 million in a seed round led by Stage 2 and a million dollar in, in, in debt financing. So first of all, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Paul, why did you start you. Sales Impact Academy? Cool, well, I think um, my, my own background is I've uh, sort of two times CRO. So I've built two you know, reasonably successful uh, companies, uh, built 100, 100 plus person teams and so, I've got kind of this first-hand experience of having to learn literally everything um, on the job whilst delivering these very kind of rapid, uh, like uh, achieving these very rapid growth, growth targets. And so when I came out of those two, those two journeys, I literally just started doing some, some voluntary teaching uh, in, in and around uh, London where I, where, I, where I now live. I spent a bunch of time um, over in New York. And, and literally started this because I wanted to sort of, you know, kind of give back, but just really wanted to start helping helping people um, who were just really, really struggling um, in in high pressure environments. And 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 that's both, you know, leadership from some sort of revenue leadership people, you know, right right down to to sort of frontline SDRs. And I think as I started just doing this voluntary teaching, uh, I just I kind of realised that actually. The, the sort of global education system has done us a massive, massive disservice, right? I actually call it the, the greatest educational travesty of the last 50 years, where, you know, higher education has entirely overlooked sales as a profession. And the knock-on consequences of that have been absolutely disastrous for our, for our profession. Partly that the profession is, is seen as a bit of sort of embarrassing to be a part of, uh, you know, you kind of like go, go get a sales job if you can't get a degree. Uh, but more than that, the core fundamental skills uh, within revenue teams and within, within sales people is, is now completely lacking because there's no structured um, formal kind of like learning, learning out there. Um, so that's really what we're the, the, the problem we're trying to solve on, on the kind of like the, the skill side. Right. Okay, Mark, always good to have you on. And, and I, I got to ask you, so even though just, I know this is the wheelhouse for you and your partners, and, and of course you got a deep bench of LPs, but lay out the investment thesis here. You know, what, what's the core problem that you saw and how you're looking at the market? Yeah, sure, Dave. So this one was a special one for me. We've spoken in the past. I mean, just personally, I've always had a similar passion to Paul that it's a, uh, it's amazing how important sales execution is to all companies, never mind just the, the startup ecosystem. And I've always personally been motivated by anything that can help the startup e ecosystem uh, increase their success. Part of why I teach at Harvard and, and try to change some of the stuff that Paul's talking about, which is like, it's amazing how little education is done around sales. Um, but in this particular one, not only personally was I excited about, but you know, from a fund perspective, we've got to look at the economic outcomes. And, um, you know, we, we've been thinking a lot about the sales tech stack. It's evolved a ton in the last couple of decades. You know, we've gone from the late 90s where every sales VP was just, they had a thing called the CRM that none of their reps even used, right? And we've come so far in 20 years, we've got all these amazing tools that help us cold call, that help us send emails efficiently and automatically and track everything. But nothing's really happened on the education side. And that's really the, the enormous gap that we've seen is um, these organizations being much more proactive around adopting technology that can improve sales execution, but um, nothing on the education side. And the other piece that we saw is it's almost like all these companies are reinventing the wheel 
of, you know, looking in the upcoming year, having a dozen salespeople to hire and trying to put together a sales enablement program within their organization to teach salespeople sales one-on-one, like how to find a champion, how to develop budget, how to develop sense of urgency. And what Paul and team can do in the first phase of SIA is, um, is can sort of centralize that so that all these organizations can benefit from the best content and the best instructors for their team. So, so Paul, exactly, thank you, Mark. Exactly what do you guys do? You know, what do you sell? I'm curious, is this sort of, mm -hmm. I'm thinking in my head, is this e-learning? Is it really part of the sales stack? Maybe you could yeah. help us understand that better. Well, I, th I think, uh... I think that this this problem of having to upskill like teams has been around like forever, and kind of going back to the kind of education problem. It's what's wild, right? Is that we would never accept this of our lawyers, our accountants, you know, or HR professionals. And imagine like a, you know, uh, you know, someone in your finance team arriving on day one and they're searching YouTube, right, to to try and uh, work out how to like put a balance sheet together. So it's it's a, it's a it's a chronic chronic problem. And so the, the way that we're ad addressing this, and, and I think the problems, the problem's well understood, but there's always been a terrible market, sort of product market fit for how the problem gets solved. So as Mark was saying, typically it's in-house revenue leaders who themselves have got massive gaps in their knowledge, hack together some in internal learning that is just pretty poor because it's not really their skill set. The other alternative is bring in really expensive consultants, but they're consultants with a very single worldview and the complexity of a modern revenue organization is very, very high these days. And so one consultant's not going to really kind of like um, cover cover every every topic you need. And then there's the kind of like fairly old fashioned sales training companies that just come in one big hit, super expensive and, and, and then sort of leave again. So the sort of product market fit to solve this has always been has always been a bit a, a bit a pretty bad. So what we've done is we've created a subscription model. We've essentially productized uh, skills development. The way that we've done that is that we is we teach live instruction. So one of the one of the big challenges um, uh, Andreessen Horowitz put a put a put a post out around this uh, quite quite recently. One of the big but one of the big problems of online learning is that this kind of huge you know uh, repository of online learning which puts all the onus on the learner to have the discipline to go through these courses and consume them in an on-demand way is actually that they're, they're pretty ineffective we see sort of completion rates of like seven to eight percent so we've always gone from a, a live instruction model so the, the the sort of ingredients are the absolute very best people in the world in their very specific skill teaching live classes just two hours per week so we're not overwhelming the learners who are already in work and they have targets and they've got a lot of pressure um and we have courses that last maybe um four to like uh 12 hours over two to sort of uh six to, to sort of seven weeks so highly practical live in, live instruction we have 70 80 sometimes even 90 percent completion rates of the of the sort of live class experience uh, and and the and the and and then teams then rapidly put that best practice into practice uh, and see amazing results in things like top of funnel or conversion um, or retention so, so live is compulsory and what and, and i presume on demand if you want to refresh you can, you, you, yeah. ha you have an yeah. on demand option yeah, everything's recorded, so you can kind of catch up on a class if you've missed it. But that, that live instruction is powerful because it's it's kind of in your calendar, right? So you, you kind of you show up. Um, but the but the really powerful thing actually is that t entire teams within companies can actually learn at exactly the same pace. So we we teach at eight o'clock Pacific, uh, eleven o'clock Eastern, four p.m. in the UK, and five p.m. Europe. So your entire European and, and, and North American teams can literally learn in the same class with a world-class expert like like a Mark or like a Kevin Dorsey or like Greg Holmes from Zoom. And you're learning from these incredible people. Class finishes, teams can come back together, talk about this incredible uh, best practice they've just they've just learned and then immediately put it into practice. And that's where we're seeing these these this incredible kind of almost instant impact on, on performance um, at, at real scale. So Mark, in thinking about your investment, you must have been thinking about, okay, how do we scale this thing? You've got an instructor component, you've got this live piece. How, how are you thinking about that at scale? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different business uh, model options there. And I actually think multiple of them are, are achievable in the, in the longer term. That's something we've been working with Paul quite a bit is like, 
they're all quite compelling. So just trying to think about which to, to start with. Um, but I, I think you've seen a lot of this in, in education models today is a mix of, of, of on demand with pre-recorded. And so I think that will be the starting point. Um, and I think like from a scalability standpoint, we were also, um, uh, we don't always try to do this with our investments, but clearly our LP base our limited partner base uh, was going to be a key ingredient to at least the first cycle of this business. Um, you know, the, our, our VC firms backed by over 250 CROs, CMOs, uh, heads of customer success, all of which are um, prospective instructors, prospective content developers and prospective customers. Um, so that was a, a little nicety around the scale uh, and investment thesis for, for this one. And what's in it for them? I mean, they get paid, obviously you have a, a stake in the game, but, but what's in it for the instructors? They get, they get paid on a sort of a, a per course basis. How, how does that model work? Yeah, we have a, a development fee for, for, for each kind of hour of teaching that, that gets created. So we, we've got a, we've, we've, we've mapped out a pretty significant curriculum. Um, and, you know, we have about 250 hours of, of live teaching now already written. We actually think it's going to be about 3000 hours of learning before you get even close to, you know, a complete curriculum for every aspect of a revenue organization from, from revenue operations to customer success, to marketing, to sales, to, to leadership and, 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 uh, and management. Um, so, but we, we have a development fee per class and then we, and we have a teaching fee, um, as well. So. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think you guys, it's really an underserved market. And when you think about it, you, you know, most organizations, they just don't invest in training. <laughs> and so, I mean, I would think you'd want to take it, I don't know what the right number is, five, 10% of your, your, your sales budget and actually put it on this and the return would be enormous. How do you guys think about the market size? Like I said before, is this, is it e-learning? Is, is it part of the CRM stack? Uh, how do you size this market? Mm. I think for, for us, uh, just say this to people, you know, a good sales, a highly skilled sales rep, right, with an email address, a phone, a phone and a spreadsheet would do really well, <laughs> okay? You don't need this world-class tech stack to do well in sales. You need the skills to be able to, to do the job. But the reverse of that's not true, right? An unskilled person with a, with a world-class tech stack won't do well. And so fundamentally, the skill level of your team is the number one most you know, important thing to get right to be successful in revenue. But as I've said to before, the, the product market fit to solve that problem has been pretty, ter pretty, pretty terrible. So we see ourselves 100% into if you're looking at like a comp, you know, you look at Gong, who we've just signed as a customer, which is fantastic. Gong has a technology that helps salespeople do better through call recording. You have Outreach, who's also a customer. They have technologies that help, you know, SDRs be more efficient in, in their outreach. And now you have Sales Impact Academy and we help with skills development of your team, but the entirety um, of your revenue function. So we absolutely see ourselves as a key part of that stack. In terms of the TAM, 60 million people in sales uh, on, according to LinkedIn, you're probably talking 150 million people in go-to-market to include all of the different, different roles. 50% of the world's companies are B2B. I mean, the TAM is, is huge, uh, but what blows my mind and this kind of goes back to this why the global education system has overlooked this because essentially if half the world's companies are b2b that's probably a proxy for, for the half the world's gdp half the world's economic growth is relying on the revenue function of half the world's companies and they don't really know what they're doing <laughs> which is absolutely staggering and if we can if we can solve that in a meaningfully meaningful way at massive scale then the impact for the, on, on, you know the impact should be absolutely enormous so Mark, no lack of TAM, but I, I know that you guys at stage two, you're also very much focused on the metrics. You have a fundamental philosophy that you know, product market fit and retention should come before hyper growth. So what were the metrics that enticed you to make this investment? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Dave, because that's where we always look first, which I think is a little different than most early stage investors. You know, there's a big, uh, uh, I guess, meme, triple, triple, double, double. Uh, that's popular in, in Silicon Valley these days, which which refers to triple your revenue in year one, triple your revenue in year two, double in year three and four and five. And, um, you know, that type of uh, hyper growth is critical, but it's often jumped to too quickly, in our opinion, um, that there's a premature 
uh, victory called on product market fit, which kills a larger percentage of businesses than is necessary. And so with all our investments, we look very heavily first at user engagement, um, any early indicators of user attention. And the numbers were just off the charts um, for SIA uh, in terms of the customers, in terms of the MPS scores that they were getting on their sessions, uh, in terms of the completion rate on their courses, in terms of the customers that started with a couple of seats and expanded to more seats once they got a taste of the program. Um, so that's where we look first as a strong foundation uh, to build a you know a scalable business, and it was off the charts positive uh, for SIA. So how about the competition? Um, you know, if I Google you know sales training software, I'll get like dozens of companies. Lessonly and Mind Tickle, Brain Shark will come up. That's not really a fit. So how how do you think mm. about the competition? How are you different? Yeah. Well, what, one thing we try to avoid uh, is is any reference to sales training because that really sort of speaks to this very old kind of fashioned way of, 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 of doing, of doing this. And I actually think that, you know, from a, from a pure pedagogy perspective, right? So from a pure learning design perspective, the old fashioned way of doing sales training was pull a whole team off site, usually in a really terrible hotel with no windows <laughs> for a day or two. And that's it. That's your learning experience. And that's not how human beings learn. Right? So just even if the content was fantastic, the learning experience was so terrible. It was just very, just very kind of ineffective. Um, so we sort of avoid kind of like sales training, the likes of mind tickle. We, you know, we're, we're actually talking to them at the moment about, about a partnership They're They're a platform play. You know, we're very much, we're, we're, we're certainly building a platform, but we're very much about the live instruction. Um, and creating, you know, like the, the biggest curriculum and the broadest curriculum uh, on the internet uh, in in the world, basically for 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 revenue teams. So the competition is kind of interesting because there is not really a direct subscription-based live like learning offering um, out there. There's 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 some similar-ish uh, companies. I, I honestly think at the moment it's kind of status quo. You know, we're we're genuinely creating a new category of in-work learning for, 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 for revenue teams. And so we're in this kind of semi sort of evangelical uh, sort of uh, phase. So really status quo is, is one of the, is one of the biggest sort of competitors. But if you think about some of those old, old fashioned sort of Miller Hyman's and, and perhaps even like the Sandler's, there's an analogy perhaps here, which is kind of interesting, which is a little bit like Siebel and Salesforce in, in, in the sort of late nineties, where in Siebel you had this kind of old way of doing things. It was a little bit ineffective. It was really expensive, not accessible to uh, huge swathes of the market. And Salesforce came along and said, hey, we're going to create this cool thing. It's going to be through the browser. It's going to be accessible to everyone. And it's going to be really, really effective. And so there's some really kind of interesting parallels almost between like a Siebel and a sort of Salesforce and what we're doing to completely kind of upend and, uh, the sort of the old fashioned way of delivering sort of sales training, if you like. And your target uh, customer profile is it's, you're selling to teams, right? B2B teams, right? It's not for individuals. Is that correct, Paul? Currently, yeah. Yeah, so currently we are sort of, we've got a big foothold in series A to series B. So broadly speaking, our, our target market currently is really fast growth technology companies. That's, that's, that's the sector that we're, that we're really focusing on. We've got a very good strong foothold in series A, series B companies. We've now won some, some much larger later stage companies. We've actually even won uh, a couple of corporates. I can't say names yet, but, but names that are very, very, very familiar and we're, we're incredibly excited by them, which could end up being thousand plus seat, seat deals because we, we do this on a, on, a, on a per seat basis. But yeah, very much at the moment, it's, it's fast growth tech companies. Uh, and we're sort of moving up the chain towards towards enterprise. And how do you deal with the, the sort of maturity curve, if you will, of your of, of, of your students? You know, you've got some that are you know brand new, just you know fresh fresh out of school. You've got others that are yeah. you know more seasoned. And what do you do? Pop them into different points of the curriculum? Or how do how do you handle that? Yeah, we have, as I say, we're, we're, we have about 30 courses right now. We have about another 15 in development. We're post this fundraise, we want to be able to get to around about 20 courses that we're developing every quarter and getting out out, out to market. So we're, we're, we're literally, we've, 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 we've sort of identified about 20 to 25 key roles across everything within revenue. That's, as I say, revenue ops, customer success, account management, sales engineering, all these different kind of roles. And we are literally plotting the, the sort of skills development for these individuals over m multiple uh, multiple years. And I think what we've, 
that never ceases to amaze me is actually that the, the breadth of learning in revenue is absolutely enormous. And what kind of just makes you makes you laugh is this is all of this knowledge that, that we're now creating is what companies just hope that their teams somehow acquire <laughs> through osmosis, through like blogs, through events. And it's just kind of crazy that there is, it's, it's absolutely insane that we don't already exist, basically. And, and if I understand it correctly, just from looking at your website, you've got you know, the entry level package, it's, I think it's up to 15 seats, and then you go scale up from there, correct? It's sort of as a seat-based license model? Yeah, it's a seat-based model, as, as, Mark, as Mark mentioned. Um, in some cases, we, we, we sell, uh, you know, let's say a 20 or $30,000 uh, deal out the gate. Uh, and that's, that's most of the team. That'll be maybe a series A, series B deal. Uh, but then we've, we've got these land, land and expand models that are working tremendously well. We have seven, eight customers in Q1 that that, uh, that bought that have doubled their spend in Q2. That, that's the impact that they're seeing. And our net revenue retention number for Q2 is looking like it's going to be 177%, which I think exceeds um, companies like Snowflake. So our, our underlying retention metrics because people are seeing this incredible impact on teams and, and performance um, is, is really, really strong. That's, and a nice, that's a nice metric compare with uh, Snowflake. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like that, it's Mark. More, it, <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mark, this is a, 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 a larger investment for stage two. You guys have been growing and, and sort of up in your game and, and maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's um, it, we're in the middle of fund two right now. So fund one was in 2018. We were doing smaller checks. It was our first uh, time out of the gate. Uh, the mission is really uh, taken off. Our LP base is really taken off. And so this deal looks a lot like more like our 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 second fund. We'll actually make an announcement in a few weeks on uh, now that we've closed that out. Uh, but it's a much larger fund, and our our first investments will be in that two to three million dollar range. And Paul, what are you going to do with the money? What are the use of funds? Put it on black. Uh, we're gonna. <laughs> we're gonna. Saratoga's look, open. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna look. The curriculum development for us is absolutely everything. But we also, um, we're also gonna be investing. You know, in building our own technology platform as well. Um, and there are some other really important aspects to the kind of overall offering. We're looking at building. Um, you know, an assessment tool, so we can actually kind of like start to, um, you know, assess skills across teams. We, we certify every, every every course has an exam, so we want to get more robust around the certification as well, because if we, we, we're, we're hoping that our certification becomes the global standard in understanding uh, for the first time in the industry what, what individual competencies and skills people have, um, which will be huge. Um, so we have we have a you know we have a, we have a, a broad uh, broad range of uh, things that we want to start 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 um, initiating now. I just wanted to quickly say. Uh, stage two has been nothing short of uh, incredible uh, from in, in every kind of which way. Of course, this investment, the the fit is kind of is, is kind of insane, but the LPs have been extraordinary in, in helping. We've got we a huge number of them are now, are now customers very quickly. Uh, Mark and the team are helping enormously on our own kind of like go to market and, and, and metrics. And I, I've I've been doing this for 20 years. I've raised over 100 million myself in, in venture capital. I've never known a venture capital firm with such value add, uh, like ever, uh, or even heard of other people getting the kind of value add that we're getting. So I, I just just wanted to a quick shout out for stage two. Quite a testimonial, you guys. Definitely stage two punches above its weight. Guys, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for for coming on. Good luck, and uh, we'll be watching. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much. All right, and thank you everybody for watching this CUBE conversation. This is Dave Vellante, and we'll see you next time.